Thank you.
That's attempt number one. Good morning. It's attempt number two. See, I should have unmuted it before I walked up here rather than making Bill run as fast as he could all the way back. But it was fun to watch you run, Bill. Um, run, Bill, run. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, sorry, I haven't really said anything yet. I was kind of in between a couple of things. Um, and, uh, but we want to welcome you here. Uh, welcome to Grace Community Chapel. We are glad that you're here with us. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for coming and meeting with us here. You say that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, that you are there in the midst of them. And we thank you that you are here in your spirit uh, through your son, Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, we pray that, uh, we, that we would honor you with our lips and we would honor you with our hearts as we sing and praise hymns to you today. Pray that you, uh, your truth would go out. Uh, and that it would impact uh, our assembly this morning. Pray that uh, everything that we do would be honoring your sight, and we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so, unfortunately, you don't get Ben today, which is really sad. Uh, you know, I like seeing Ben do announcements. It gives me, like, a thrill. So, like, the fact that he's not here, I'm not thrilled, Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyways, um, but I, you, you stuck with me a little bit more today. I apologize. So a, a couple announcements. Um, so we have the ladies Bible study, which was originally scheduled for last week, but we didn't do because we got some snow uh, and we got it again on Friday. I don't know what this pattern is, but it's got to stop. Um, so we got some, we, we are going to be doing it tonight. So it's a uh, two to four today. Um, and uh, so we'd love to have you come out if you're a lady and that's ages 12 and up, 10 and up, 10 and up, okay, I was, I was looking, looking for the age group there, so 10 and up, uh, you're considered a lady, female, 10 and up, okay, all right, that's going to be a really great time, uh, I know the two ladies who are kind of leading it, and it's, I'm biased specifically on one of them, but, um, you know, that's, it's great. Uh, also, just as a reminder, we do have a midweek Bible study, uh, we've been going through First Peter, and we may make it before the end of the year um, to get finished with First Peter. <laughs> um, as long as I don't keep going back over chapter 3, we'll be all right. Um, so come out, 6.30 to 8. It's a great time. Get to know each other better. Um, pray, and uh, it's a great time. Uh, for the next two announcements, I'm going to have someone else come up so you have a better-looking face. Uh, so uh, if I could have Mike come up and give our next two announcements. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just two announcements. Uh, this upcoming Saturday, the 12th, we're going to have a work day here at the church. Um, just some interior work, so don't, nothing outside, not going to be out in the cold or anything like that. Um, really, for all skill levels, we've got some cleaning things we've got to do and um, some maintenance and repairs on a few things. Uh, We'd love to have as many people as we can to help us with that. So that will be this Saturday, the 12th. And um, it usually start at 8 o'clock-ish around that time, and then and go as long as we can. And <laughs> but if you get there at 9, no one's going to complain. No, you can show up at any time, but we'll probably start around 8-ish. Men's breakfast. Men's breakfast, we're going to cancel until the end of the month. And then the second announcement is me and my wife would like to invite people over on the 19th, which is this Saturday, which will be a Saturday as well. Um, we're going to have ice fishing. I'm hoping to have the ice rink cleaned off. I'm going to try to clean it off today. Hopefully the snow that came didn't ruin the ice. Um, and then I have a fire outside so we can stay warm. If it's too cold, people can go inside. You can look out on the pond even from inside the house. Um, so hopefully we have ice fishing, skating, there's sledding the kids can do off the snow and stuff. So we'd like to have people over for that. That's going to be on the 19th at 1 o'clock. So all are invited to that, and we'll have hot dogs and stuff over the fire and stuff like that. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right. That is our announcements, other than the ones that were scrolling on the screen. Uh, if you get here uh, more than five minutes after we start, you'll see that, that uh, those scrolling announcements will give you at least a general idea of what's going on. 
If you missed them, you can also go online. Yes? What's that now? Yeah, so we had discussed having an outreach meeting today, but with the ladies' Bible study being what it is at 2 o'clock, I didn't want to have them have to stay after the service. And so we're going to do the outreach meeting next week. Outreach meeting next week. And I know that Jen still won't be able to make it because going to something cool, but we're, we're still going to hold the meeting. All right. Yes? Oh, okay, school board meeting tomorrow night. If you're part of the school board, that's you. Okay. Any other announcements I'm forgetting? All right. Uh, turn in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 to 11. The guy who picked out the sermon has got a large section for me to read this morning. All right, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1, reading out of the ESV. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who spoke of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is even able to raise from these, uh, from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree thereof that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and let's continue to worship him in song.
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. have a word of prayer. Father God, great is your faithfulness. We are assured that through God all things will work together for good. Thank you, Lord, that through Christ we are no longer slaves to sin and that nothing can separate us from your love. We submit this to you in the name of your holy son, Jesus. Amen. Um, it's based on the hymn Mighty Fortress, and it starts out like the hymn, but then it goes into a contemporary Christian music. Um, a mighty fortress really refers to God as our protector, defender, and refuge. And uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with this word, a bulwark is a trusty shield and weapon. It took me a while to figure that one out. It's not a word that I use every day, but um, <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll hear it. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. A
Sunday because of a snowstorm, it kind of messes with our plans for introducing new songs. So this week we've got another new song, but I think it's pretty easy and it's, it's very repetitive. It's called Come Worship the King, and the, the chorus is based on 1 Chronicles 16.27. talks about the splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. One, two, one, two, three, four.
Okay, I don't know if you just saw that, but Kent threw off the entire service by not exiting the same way he always does. So if the rest of the e after the morning goes poorly, it's Kent's fault. Uh, I saw you give me the hand signal and everything. I know, yeah, I should have should have picked up on that. I, you're, you're right, it would have been. I jest. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm excited about this morning. I was, I was dreading this morning last week, and then God gave me a snowstorm. And this week I'm excited about it. <laughs> it was my fault. It was my fault. So I, I, I say I'm dreading it. I, I was dreading it because this is, this is a hard conversation we're going to have today. We're going we're to talk about a topic that probably has been the most debated in the church all, for all of time. We're going to talk about baptism today. And uh, it, it can create tension, it can create problems, and it shouldn't because it's, it's an in-faith, in-house discussion. It's something that we can talk about and we can say this is what the Bible teaches and we, we, we can hold firm to a particular thing and recognize that there's dissenting opinions, right? Um, but it did, it did cause some, some anxiety a little bit, but then God gave me peace with it. So today you're, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm excited. So hopefully you are likewise. Um, Let's pray. Uh, Father God, I just want to thank you um, just for the worship that we've had already. Uh, you are the king. Your son is the king of all kings. All authority has been granted unto him, and by that we go and we accomplish the mission of the church, and that is to proclaim your gospel, that you are reconciling man to yourself, and part of that mission is to baptize them. And Father, I pray that as we discuss baptism this morning, that it would be honoring your sight, it would be true to your word, uh, and Father, that you would be glorified most in all. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so uh, just as a recap, because I keep doing this recap, because at the end of the series, I just want you to at least have like these, these few things, right? And if you, if you got these few things, then everything was worth it, right? So uh, the church, it's not a building. It's a, uh, does anyone remember? Yeah, okay, everyone say, yeah, I know, yeah, don't, you can shut it out. Yes. It's the people, okay, yeah, all right, people, yeah, called community, people, all right, yeah, whew, man, you guys are going to be rough this morning. Uh, so I was reading a book this week, and it said if the pastor isn't excited and isn't, in, isn't into it, uh, how can he expect the congregation to be? And I was like, that's a really fair point. Uh, so if I'm up here, not, not necessarily putting on a show, but if I'm not excited about the topic, why would you be? Um, so... Then we talked about purpose of the church, right? Does it, we, we kind of boiled that down to worship corporately, to preach the truth while stirring one another up to love and good works, that we are going to pursue holiness in community while meeting the needs of the household of faith. That's, that's, a, that's a full purpose of what we're aiming to do in our meeting. And we did four, three or four weeks on that. And then we talked about mission for two weeks. And we talked about ultimately how the ultimate mission is to glorify God and to worship him forever. But as part of that, we are to call people into that worship by making disciples. And we are to go, we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, which we'll talk about more today, uh, and then teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's what Jesus said. And then we are to be salt and light in the communities that we live. And by our, our very living out Christ's work in us, in our communities, that it's going to preserve, and it's going to expose, and it's going to bring to the light the truth of God in those that we encounter on an everyday basis. So then two weeks ago, we talked about communion. We started talking about the ordinances. We'll talk about that again today. We talked about the ordinance of communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, all those different terms. Okay, and if you didn't get that message, there's this handy thing on Facebook. You can go back and you can look at an old message, or you can go on YouTube, and it's there too. So I'd encourage you to do that. If you didn't get it, so you know what, what, what's Lord's Supper all about, which we will be doing next week, Lord's Supper. So if you want to prepare for it, there's a great way of doing it. So today we're going to be talking about baptism. And, and as I said earlier, baptism ultimately kind of comes into one of the most, there's so many different avenues and directions you could go. And it is not my intention to begin a six-week study on baptism from the pulpit, Okay. Uh, that would probably be required in order to handle this topic sufficiently uh, in its entirety. Um, and so I, I, I have no desire to do that. We're going to do a, a scope, a 10,000-foot view, 
Um, and uh, if you guys have specific questions or you want to say, hey, I really think this and come talk to me. Let's have that conversation. I'd love to get a cup of coffee and we can do that. Um, so at GCC, we teach that it is an ordinance. We've talked about this uh, two weeks ago. Ordinance as opposed to sacrament. Sacrament, that which gives grace. Ordinance is just a sign, right? Something that God, Jesus, has ordained to be done through his church through all ages. That's why he said with the communion, do this in remembrance of me. And then also with baptism, go and baptize. Two commands directly from Jesus. That's why we do those two. Ordinance. Uh, so at GCC, we teach that baptism is an ordinance, a sign, and a symbol of a spiritual reality. Uh, we hold that there are two ordinances, as I discussed, communion, uh, which was Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, which I already quoted, and baptism, which I also quoted from Matthew 28, 19. GCC's statement is baptism is to be administered only upon the profession of faith by immersion, thereby declaring our faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. We will be coming back to this statement later on, like we did with the communion statement, okay? So, as I said, we don't have proper time to do all of the research and all of it and talk about baptismal regeneration and, and all of those things. We don't have time to address all of them, okay? So what I want to do is I want to hit some of the high point issues so you know what the issues are with baptism and that if you didn't know, then you know and you can discover yourself, okay? So the first thing when going to baptism, the first thing that gets asked, and it's part of our confession, and this is an in-house discussion, is credo-baptism or pedo-baptism. Credo-baptism or pedo-baptism. Now, if you don't know what those words mean, credo being creed and pedo being child, or more accurately, infant. Right? So the question is, is do we baptize infants or do we only baptize people who are professing? Okay? So that's the question. So, pedo baptism is the teaching that children should be baptized, specifically infants and newborns, and that children should be baptized uh, is dependent upon tradition. Uh, some will say that it's dependent upon the intention and desires of the parent. So, uh, if you were to think about denominations that teach this, the Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, some Reformed denominations, Methodists, Nazarenes, and others. Okay? They all teach pedo baptism. Uh, most denominations hold the rite of confirmation, which includes a profession of faith once they're, they're at the age to be able to profess that faith. So most of those denominations would say, okay, there comes a point in time in that baptized infant's life where they reach an age where we need to hear some sort of confession, right? And then there's a whole confirmation ceremony. And then the Catholics and some others will wait until that point before they give them communion. Okay? So that's, that's part of that whole period. Okay? Pedo baptism. Credo baptism, that's belief baptism, is the teaching that only professing believers are to be baptized. Uh, each tradition may set an age that that creed can be confessed sufficiently to perform a baptism. But in most cases, it's at the discretion of the one performing the baptism. Uh, so most evangelicals, Baptists, Anabaptists, Reformed Baptists, kind of noting the trend of Baptists, uh, Pentecostal and Seventh-day Adventists are all credo-based baptisms. Um, so that's one area of debate. Do we baptize kids or only those who profess? Right? And, and people who believe in infant baptism, of course, also believe in creedal baptism. Right? Uh, they, they, they also, it's not like, oh, sorry, you're an adult. Too bad, you missed your chance. Uh, that's, that's not what they think. Um, so they would hold both, but the one is not held by the other. The next question is salvific baptism. Is, is it, does baptism save or is it a sign? Does baptism save or is it a sign? Uh, so, specifically, the Catholics, Anglicans, Episcopalians, agnostic Pentecostal, or not agnostic, sorry, apostolic, that would be maybe the same thing. Uh, don't tell them I said that. Uh, apostolic Pentecostals um, and Lutherans are a little bit split on this, uh, but there's a salvific, as in you cannot be saved until you've also been baptized. So they believe that it is part of your salvation experience and that you're not fully saved until you have received that baptism of water. 
Okay? Conversely, um, we would say that the sign, baptism is a sign, not salvific, the Anabaptists, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Seventh-day Adventists, Lutherans, again split, and Pentecostal, non-apostolic, uh, all teach that it's a sign, not actual regeneration. Uh, the, the problem with the belief of baptism regeneration, which we're not going to really address too much today, um, is that you get into all these weird things like emergency baptisms. So someone's about to die and you, you have to quickly perform last rites for them and, or some sort of baptism to kind of make sure that they're saved. Uh, the idea that baptism actually washed all of your previous sins prior to the baptism, that was something that was held late 6th century, even 5th century, less commonly in the 3rd and 4th century. It's rumored that Constantine wait, waited until just days before he died to be baptized, so that way all of his previous sins would have been washed clean. Right? So it's, it's a really weird, wonky kind of system, and that's what ends up coming if you go into the baptism in that sense. Um, also, ritual washing and stuff like that that occurs. So, all of that to say, there's a lot of questions around baptism. So, last one. Immersion or sprinkling and pouring? Right? What, what is it? Um, typically, your Eastern Orthodox, Anabaptists, Baptists, Pentecostals, and Seventh-day Adventists all say you have to immerse. However, Anglican, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, and the Church of Nazarene say you can sprinkle, you can pour, you can do whatever. They would say immersion is great too, but you can also do the other. In fact, um, I was reading uh, on a Presbyterian website and they said uh, it's optimal to immerse, but you can do these other. Right? So, so no one believes anti-immersion. No one's anti-immersion. They just include more options. So, other issues, the manner of baptism. Do you baptize three times or once? So in the early church, there was a small group that used to dunk you three times. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You thought it was bad being dunked once, man. <laughs> Just get back in there. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that was, that was a conversation. Do you baptize forwards or do you baptize backwards? So then if you can imagine going forwards and three times, you know, you're going to start feeling like you're drowning. <laughs> Right? But that's a question, right? What, what, what manner? What way? Do you do it in the name of just Jesus or do you do it in the Trinity? Right? There's, there's debate on that. Can you rebaptize? Is that, is that okay? Or is it not? It's a good question. We'll talk about that. Ex apo operato, we talked about this last one, or ex apo operanti. Is it the baptism itself or is it the person who's doing the baptism? What's more important? If it's the person that's doing the baptism, then if they sinned and sinned against the church, then your baptism doesn't count, right? And so that's, that was another thing that was discussed, right? And obviously the church came to the conclusion pretty much unanimously that it doesn't matter who does it, it's about what you do, not, and the person who's receiving the act, not the person who's doing it, right? So, but those are all issues within baptism, and there are more, but those are the most common. So do you see how we easily could become separated, over this issue. In fact, we have. Uh, that's why the Baptists and the Anabaptists are what they're called, is because that's the issue that separates us from others, is, is ultimately that issue. Now, Grace is a non-denominational church, but I will tell you that this, in this area, they are Baptist. <laughs> that's what it is. Okay, so baptism, history. Let's talk a little bit about it. Matthew chapter 3. If you're not already there, go ahead and turn there. If you're not sufficiently confused, I promise we will, we will unconfuse you. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip a little bit, 5 and 6, and then 11. So just so you know what I'm doing before I do it. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Skipping down to verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Skipping down to verse 11. 
John speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So baptism was actually more of a common practice even beyond John the Baptist in the first century. It was not unique to John. Uh, John certainly, his primary mission was around repentance and then being baptized, preparing the way for the Messiah. Um, but there were others who were doing similar washings and baptisms in the first century. So it was, it was an understood practice in the day. Okay? And some argue that it's from an Old Testament cleaning of the priests and there's some sort of ceremonial washing. You probably could, if we were to do a further study, we'd probably talk a little bit about that. Um, but either way, we see here that John came as the one preparing the way for the Messiah, and part of what he did was to baptize people, uh, you'll notice, post-repentance of their sin, as part of a ritual of cleansing. This baptism was a sign of an inward reality of their repentance. The, the fact that the practice that John was uh, doing is not really, we don't really know exactly, we don't have a whole lot of extenuant circumstances and manuscripts of stuff where it was happening a lot before John, but John certainly made it popular. Um, so looking at it, uh, he, his whole ministry uh, was basically the practice of baptism and calling the general public to repent prior to the Messiah's ministry. Uh, in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it's interesting um, that we see that right after John's baptizing, we see Jesus baptized by John, and then Jesus' disciples begin baptizing people in his ministry. Now, if you want to, you can turn there, John chapter 4. And if you don't want to turn there, I'll get there fast. John chapter 4, and verses 1 through 3. And it says this, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and then John writing a little note here, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. So you see here that there was this continued baptizing going on post the ministry of John. That Jesus was having his disciples baptize other people in the same manner of John. And what's interesting is if we were to go to Acts, you'll see that there's a situation that people are encountered that they've only received John's baptism and not the baptism of Jesus. And so they rebaptize these guys because they say, hey, you didn't receive the full baptism of Jesus in the Holy Spirit, Jesus and the Father. And they receive that baptism. So there might be an argument for rebaptism if you aren't baptized the right way. And we would have to define what that is. So, what is baptism and why do we do it? Obviously, John was doing it for repentance. That was the part of the point. It was a cleansing washing as part of the, you repented, now we're going to have some sort of symbol to wash away, to, to show kind of what that repentance was. Um, I'm going to read from the London Baptist Confession. This is from 1689. They had a couple. 1689 is a good one. Uh, baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to those baptized, it is a sign of their fellowship with him in his death and resurrection of their being grafted into him, uh, of the remission of sins and submitting themselves to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk of newness in life. So that's specifically what we describe baptism is and is for. And I'm going to break this down a little bit for you. So one, first off, Jesus commanded that baptisms should happen. Um, and it's the only other ordinance other than the Lord's Supper that we see commanded. Uh, so we talked about Matthew 28, 19, which says Jesus tells them, go and baptize. But also in Mark 16, 16, he said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not is condemned, does not believe is condemned. Okay? So we see that there's this pattern of, hey, be baptizing. This is something you should be doing. It's commanded. Uh, two, it's the practice of the early church, according to Acts. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to try not to get you to turn too much, but a little bit. Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 is pretty long. You're going to turn to verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And I'm going to read down to 41. 
Now when they, referring to the house of Israel, listening to Peter, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this is the promise for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone to whom the Lord our, Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Okay? So you see that there's this consistent repent, believe, be baptized. Right? It's, it's a consistent pattern in the New Testament. Let's look one other place, Acts chapter 8. Flip over to Acts chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 12, and then we're going to do a jump. Verse 12. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. This is Philip preaching. And he says, when they, and, the, and the crowd, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, I think it's interesting that um, it mentions and women, right? Um, think about it, most of the time the men performed all the ritual acts. And in fact, if we were to look back to the Abrahamic covenant, the men were circumcised, but nothing happened to the women. So it's very interesting that women are included in the baptism because, hey, guess what? They're co-heirs equal before the cross, right? That's, that's the testament of the New Testament and of Christianity. So, 12, believed, baptized, both men and women. Flip over to verse 35, same chapter. Maybe a familiar story for you, the Philip and the eunuch. Verse 35 of chapter 8. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this, this scripture, referring to the one Isaiah, he told them the good news about Jesus. And when they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Okay? So there's this consistent pattern in the scriptures that when someone expresses a faith, that they are, what's interesting, immediately baptized. Immediately baptized. Like, it's not like, a, hey, in a couple Sundays, we'll consider throwing out the baptismal, and, <laughs> you know, then we'll do that. Um, it, it's immediate. Um, granted, you know, they're walking around, there's probably streams and water around, and let's go, let's go for a swim, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the pattern. Okay, so it's the pattern, Christ commanded it, it's the pattern of the, Old, of the New Testament. Number three, it's a sign of what's occurred in the believer's life. I'm going to read for you two passages, uh, you don't have to turn there, if you want to, you can, but uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we certainly will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Also, Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the power of working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is intended to be a very serious event in the life of a believer. It's intended to be a time when the believer is recognizing that they are aligning themselves with Christ and making a public profession and saying, just like Christ died and was raised, I am going to die and I know that I will be raised. That, that is specifically the symbolism designed with baptism. Now, um, I think about baptism like a wedding. I think of baptism like a wedding, okay? And bear with me here, okay? Wedding is a time where we exchange a symbol, and I'm wearing one today, of something that occurred or is going to occur between these two people where they become one flesh. Genesis talks about that, how the two shall become one. That's, a, that's not our necessarily reality that we always see, okay? Sometimes we don't always feel one, right? That's just the reality, right? But that's a, that's a spiritual reality that's true 
of a husband and wife. And the marriage ceremony and the marriage symbols are a representation, a physical representation of what is occurring or what has occurred on a spiritual level. Right? So when, I'm, when I take off my ring, I'm no longer not married to my wife, Alyssa. Like it's, not, it's not how that works, right? Um, although some people in society might think that. Um, but that's, that's not how it works. It's a spiritual reality that's apart from the symbol. But the symbol's important as it directs us to the spiritual reality. Please hear me on this. One cannot continue in faithfulness to Christ without partaking in baptism. It is an expected reality for those who have come to Christ. That doesn't mean that you should take it lightly, but at the same time, it is an expected reality. It doesn't mean you can't be saved. Don't hear that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But it is an expected reality. And, and I would have to ask you, what is the reason why you will not become baptized? And I'll tell you, for me, even at a younger age, it was primarily pride. It was primarily fear, anxiety, what will people think? And it was all related to maybe anxiety. How's it going to work? What's it going to happen? And all those things are fleshly, and I have to put those things aside. Right? All right. So that's the what, the why, the method. So grace holds immersion. I'm going to tell you why we hold immersion. The word baptize or baptizo, it literally means to immerse, and it's expressive of the action of immersing something or someone into liquid. Usually it's water, although often it can refer to oils or dyes. John Calvin, who was a man who supports infant baptism, and a variety of methods of baptism, uh, does concede this point specifically in his treatise on baptism. I'm going to go ahead and read this for you, and you'll hear, I'm not necessarily saying what he said is exactly right, but, but listen to what he says. He said, but whether the person being baptized should be wholly immersed, or whether trice or once, or whether he should be only sprinkled or poured, uh, these are details of no importance, but ought to be optimal to churches according to the diversity of the countries. Yet, the word baptize means to immerse, and it is clear that the rite of immersion was observed in the ancient church. So John Calvin says, eh, we could kind of do a little bit of whatever we want, but he does admit the word does mean to immerse, and it was the pattern of the early church. So, and and he, he holds the opposite view that we do at this church, and, and ultimately of me. But, but he, he concedes those points, and I think those points are pretty important. The Didache, it's a late first century, uh, early second century document, says this, but concerning baptism, thus shall ye baptize, having first recited all of these things, and it's referring to the faith beforehand that was recited, uh, ba- baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in living water, that means running, but if thou dost not have living water, then baptize in some other water. And if thou art not able to in cold, then do it in warm. But if thou hast neither, then pour out water on the head thrice in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before baptism, let him baptize him uh, and him that is being baptized fast. And if anyone else are able, that thou shalt be able to do so uh, and be baptized and fast a day or two before. Okay? So in the Didache, the pattern was is if you could, the one who was being baptized and the one that was baptizing would fast a day or two before, that you would do it in living water. That means running water, like a stream or something like that, or a pond or something like that. And then they said if you couldn't do that, then you know, whatever other water was available, preferably cold. Now, we've left that conti- entirely, right? We, we just, we've left that entirely. Now, we're going to do it in warm water. Um, you know, then, then they said if not in any warm and then if you don't have enough water, because there's places where you don't have that kind of water, and then, and then they would do the pouring, right? And so that's, that's the testimony of the early church. Beyond that, we could go into other passages that talk about it. We could talk about Matthew 3.16, Jesus came up out of the water. Uh, John 3.23, because the water was plentiful there, John baptized. Um, Acts 8.36, we just read, came to some water, both went down into the water, um, the eunuch probably had plenty of water from his travel from Egypt up and back. 
Um, he probably could have poured over if that was sufficient. Okay, so immersion, I believe, from the testimony of Scripture, that is what Scripture would require. Okay, all right, we're almost done. Hang in there with me. The one baptized. So we talked about why do we baptize, what, who, or we talked about why, talked about what, we talked about the method, now let's talk about the who. And I don't mean the band. Okay, let's not talk about them. Uh, so we baptize professing adults and children. That's who we baptize. If you're still in Acts 8, which you may be, I'd like you to take a look at verse 37. Now, all of you are frantically looking, and you're seeing there's no verse 37 in your Bible, and you're like, what the heck's going on here? There's not. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, so uh, we don't have time for a full treatise on why there's no verse 37 in your Bible. But if you go back to February 28th last year, we talk about manuscripts, and we talk about all of that sort of stuff. So go back on YouTube. You can find out why there's no particular verses in your Bible. This is one of those verses that was probably added later on in the 13th or 14th century um, to express a true idea of the text. So monks were probably concerned because you see, it doesn't say that the eunuch actually professed faith. Now, I think the context of this, it's clear he has, but he didn't. And so uh, if you find it in your study Bible, you may actually have it written out or it might say, hey, verse 37 says this. I'm gonna read it for you. Um, it specifically says this, uh, do, 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 sorry. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Okay. So I, I feel like that was added for emphasis so that people realize, hey, this eunuch isn't, he, he's not just getting baptized to be saved. Like he, he believes. Um, later, we were able to really quickly identify that that wasn't in the original. And which is why it's been pulled out in your Bibles. But verse divisions are not canon, so they came later. So then your verse 37 has been pulled out and goes from 36 to 38. Okay. What this demonstrates is that is the intention of the text, and that's the intention that people recognized of the text. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That's Paul. And he's talking about these divisions in the church where like, oh, I was baptized by this guy, I was baptized by this guy. And Paul's like, I, didn't, I wasn't sent to baptize, I was sent to preach the gospel. He makes a difference between the two, okay? Acts 2.41 says, who received his word were baptized. So we see that there is a receiving of the word first, then a baptism. And even Matthew 28 verse 19 says, make disciples, baptize them, right? So the disciples get made first, then we baptize. So that's the pattern of the New Testament. So, why not pedo baptism? Why not baptizing infants? I feel like this one is probably the one out of all the controversies that still racks the faithful, right? Like it really is really having a hard time without, and maybe the immersion one, which that one's I think a little less, less so it's, you know, basically draw battle lines and it's hard to fight in the text. But, but this one I think is the one that we hear the most coming up. So do the scriptures command infants to be baptized? You can look throughout all of, this, all of the New Testament, and I, I'm going to tell you, there is no clear New Testament teaching that commands infants to be baptized. Even people that I highly respect, like R.C. Sprawl, who is a believer in infant baptism, he, he would tell you, you can't find it specifically commanded in the New Testament. Okay, that's, that's true. Um, what's interesting is, is circumcision, which people relate to baptism, who believe in pedo baptism, is clearly stated that you are to, that you are to circumcise uh, infants. Genesis chapter 17, verse 12 says, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money or from any foreigner who is not your offspring. And it's interesting that in all of the conversations that Paul has, especially in Galatians or in Romans, where he talks about circumcision, he doesn't say, yeah, so you were doing that. You don't have to do that anymore, but now baptize. He could have said that. That would have been a perfect place if he wanted to institute infant baptism, a perfect place to have that conversation. Hey, stop circumcising, start baptizing. It's just replacement, right? He could have said that. He didn't. 
So we're arguing from silence. Um, does the New Testament state, as some do, that baptism is a sign of the New Covenant? The answer is no. Nowhere in Scripture in the New Testament does it say that baptism is a sign of the New Covenant. Um, if there is a sign of the New Covenant, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the sign of the New Covenant, the guarantor and sealer for that day, coming day, the second coming. So then the last thing comes up with pedo baptism is like, oh, what about households? Right? You see households saved in Acts, and they baptize the whole household. So somebody makes a profession, and everybody's baptized, including the babies. Um, and if you looked at them, and I'm going to go ahead and just look at two of them for you. You don't have to turn there. You can. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 44, is the first household that we see baptized. That's Cornelius. And verse 44 says, while Peter was still, was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of those who heard the word. So we see that this kind of this unique situation going on where the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles for the first time. And Peter goes, oh, they can receive the Holy Spirit like we can without circumcision, without the law, without all those things. But you'll notice that it says in verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. There's a certain element to which you have to be able to hear the word and arguably respond in order to have the Holy Spirit fall upon you. Acts chapter, six, or Acts chapter 10, verse 46, two verses later, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Now, I'll tell you, babies definitely speak in tongues, um, but I don't think that's what's meant by this passage, um, right? So whatever's going on here is definitely unique, something that a person needs to be old enough. And then Acts chapter 10, verse 47, the next verse, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have just received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Okay, So I, I, I think Cornelius is a bad example of a household. Sure, they baptized the household. I, I don't think there's infants there being baptized. I think they're intentionally excluded. Uh, Philippian jailer, Acts chapter 16, verse 31, uh, and they said, and he asked them, how do, we, how, do I, how do I get saved? How do I believe? And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. There you go. He believes his whole household saved, right? Not necessarily, because verse the next verse says, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all of those who were in his house. So again, there's an assumption that they're speaking the word to these people, they're receiving the word and then being baptized, which is the pattern of the New Testament. But we don't see any specific reference to, and then the babies were, in, were baptized, right? No one says that. So you're, you're assuming that they're there when we don't have any information of that. R.C. Sprawl actually has come out and said, look, that's the worst argument you could possibly come up with for infant baptism is the household argument. And he comes from a covenantal argument, which we addressed briefly. So, either way, there's a clear lack of biblical instruction here, and I would not want to argue for a positive position on something, on something that God clearly did not ordain in Scripture. If God really wanted us to baptize the babies, then they sh he could have made it clear. And he's pretty clear about a lot of things. So, coming back to the statement of GCC on, in the Constitution. Baptism is to be administered only upon the profession of faith by immersion, thereby declaring our faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. So, downloaded a bunch of stuff to you guys this morning. That's a lot of information. I recognize that. Some of you are like, this is all new. Ugh. And some of you are like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. So wherever you're at, if you want to talk more about this, reach out. I'd love to talk more. Right? This is an in-house discussion. This is an in-the-faith discussion. Here's some things that I want you to take away. Uh, if you have not repented and placed your trust in Jesus Christ, that is the first thing you must do. Regardless of the discussion on baptism, that is the first thing you must do. And if you have, the next step in your faith is to be baptized. That is the next step. So, if you are here this morning and you are a professing believer that has not been baptized, talk to Paul, talk to myself. We would love to set up the time to do it. it would ex nothing would excite us more. I promise you. And like I said before, if you're hesitant, I would have to ask you, what is the cause of that hesitancy? Could it possibly be the flesh getting in the way of the Spirit? 
Pride, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, and unbelief are not, except for unbelief in Christ, but just general, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I don't, know what I'm, I don't know what to think. It's not reasons not to get baptized. Likewise, those of you who are baptized, remember your baptism. Remember what it means to be baptized, to truly die like Christ and rise to new life. Because if you've been newly born and you have the new life, we need to live in a manner such as the new life would demand. And it's a call to die to this kingdom of this world and be raised to the next one. Let's pray. Father God, I feel like that was a, a lot of information. And Father, I, I pray, that, uh, pray that you would do with it as you will. And Father, I, I thank you for the symbol of baptism and what it means in the sign and what it means in my heart and how it means that I get to experience that new life with you because of the death of Christ. And I want to be mirrored in that death of Christ. Father, I pray that uh, those in the audience today would learn and cling to your scriptures, learn what they have to say about your ordinances. I pray that you would be honored and glorified in our conversations, in the unity that's promoted from your spirit. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Jeremy, it sounds like the Holy Spirit is leading us to baptism. If anyone's hesitant because they don't have a bathing suit, uh, I think we saw a whole rack of them at Sam's Club yesterday. No, we have baptismal gowns, right? Yeah, yeah so right. don't be shy. It really is a wonderful experience, and I say that because I was baptized since I've been at this church. It was in the summer. Not bad, not bad. Won't you join us for our last worship song?
Father in heaven, thank you so much for your holy word and the knowledge we gain from reading and hearing about it. We never grow weary of learning from it and are grateful for the guidance it provides. Lord, please continue to guide us throughout this week and lift up those who can't be here this morning. And lastly, we pray that if it was your will, we have a baptism here at Grace Community Chapel this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.